Uh, thank you, Gerhard, for, uh, for that really warm introduction. And of course, I'd like to thank Nomura for providing the venue and, of course, the CFA uh, for organizing the event. Uh, I know a number of you may have seen me speak a few years ago about factor investing. Uh, and so I'd like to revisit a fairly old theme now, but really with a fresh new data set. And so what you hear today is applying the standard factor techniques, looking at uh, the emerging market. And specifically, I will focus on China and some of the emerging uh, uh, Asian equity markets to give you a sense of how they work outside of the more familiar US large cap data set. And hopefully, as you hear uh, this, this discussion on factor investing in Asia, you also gain appreciation for um, the underlying driver of the factor returns. Is it driven by risk? Is it driven by behavioral anomalies? And I think throughout the presentation, you'll get a sense of uh, what my personal biases is from, but I, I let you form your own opinion. Hopefully, you'll also get from this conversation uh, a deeper insight into what's going on in, in China. How is the market similar uh, and yet very different from the more developed Western uh, equity markets? Uh, and hopefully, uh, you also get an opportunity to understand how differences in market microstructure can have very profound difference in the way in which behavioral anomalies uh, and factor returns uh, express themselves. All right, so with that, let me first of all start with the summary. All right, so key takeaways for today. First, what you'll see just empirically is that many of these factors, these investment strategies, quantitative investment strategies, do better in emerging markets. Right? And a lot of that has to do with emerging markets being more inefficient, and therefore there's a larger reservoir for alpha. And I think that part is intuitive, but as you look at the data, it'll become more clear. The second key takeaway is when you're looking at market characteristics, and you're trying to forecast which markets are likely to have more alpha, where your active managers can be more successful, the key statistic you really want to look at is the fraction of the trading that's conducted by retail individuals. So what's referred to as retail participation in a marketplace. Again, the assumption there is you know, retail individuals are less sophisticated, they're more prone to behavioral uh, driven mistakes, and they're really the alpha reservoir. And then finally, uh, there is localization needed. And it's not because retail individuals are different from one geography to the next. It's not that Chinese are inherently very different from Americans, from the Brits. Uh, they're at the behavioral level quite similar. Now what makes these behavioral anomalies and these factors work differently largely has to do with the institutional features of those markets. And therefore you have to sort of localize your signal in a way such that reflects the uh, differences in local market structure. So these are the key takeaways. Now before I talk about alpha, before I talk about what factors work, how they work, how well do they work, uh, let me start with the beta story. The beta story uh, is one that's fairly familiar. Emerging markets and countries inside emerging markets, they grow faster. If you look at GDP growth, if you look at how GDP growth translate into corporate fundamental growth, um, these markets offer more growth. The question, of course, is can you buy it reasonably? Uh, and so it's a matter of understanding how are the different betas in emerging markets priced. And also, it's in understanding um, are these beta sufficiently low correlated when you add that into your current develop market portfolio, when you add EM into DM, do they produce a good diversification benefit? And specifically, what makes China kind of interesting is when you look at the underlying Chinese uh, earnings growth, uh, it does grow quite rapidly, and you're not surprised when you're looking at an economy that has 5% plus real growth per annum. But what's interesting is while the underlying economy can be quite integrated, and none of you are surprised that the modern economies are all quite integrated. 
right? Uh, China exports to the U.S., so when U.S. is having a bad Christmas, China is having bad corporate earnings growth. And that's largely true with most emerging Asia, and it's in some ways quite true as well with the more commodities-driven part of the emerging market, since these underlying raw commodities are often inputs into total production. And so at the underlying economics level, there's quite a bit of integration and high correlation. But yet what you see is across these different markets, the betas are not as correlated as you might imagine. And that actually speaks to segmentation of markets, meaning the investors that are driving the discount rates that are used to discount the cash flows they're in some ways more disaggregated and therefore what you're seeing in terms of low correlation just has to do with sort of local risk preferences as they vary over time. And so that's something useful to take into account that you are buying otherwise global growth but you're buying in a format that actually provides some low correlation to your portfolio which is quite nice. Now what I show on this graph is really looking at the different betas that you could get access to in emerging markets. Now I refer to these as betas and you can think of this as alpha sources. Uh, you know, they are sort of the value factor, uh, productivity factor, so on and so forth. So things that you're, you're fairly familiar with. And what you see is generally a pattern where the green uh, is higher than the orange and the orange is higher than the blue. Uh, and the green is really emerging Asia when you apply these uh, factors to individual countries in emerging Asia and contrast that to uh, Japan, which is more to develop Asia, so it's oftentimes people say about maybe two, three decades ahead of, say, you know, China. And then of course you have in the blue U.S., which one may say is another few decades in terms of maturity uh, ahead of Japan. And you have this, at least on average, a pattern where the more inefficient markets provide a larger return to a particular factor. Again, the intuition. Uh, not surprisingly, has to do with the amount of retail individuals in those markets. This is a correlation matrix that shows um, basically emerging Asia and their correlation with the broader DM market. And as I said, you shouldn't be surprised that emerging Asias are fully integrated with the global economy in terms of trades, right? They are the biggest trading partners for the U.S. and uh, the Western economy. So what should actually surprise you is that oftentimes the pairwise correlations are quite low, about 0.3 on average. Right? So essentially you are buying global growth, but you're now buying global growth at potentially a lower valuation when you're sort of timing based on valuation, but you're certainly buying global growth uh, with sort of lower correlation that creates a portfolio benefit. I'm going to skip around. So with that bit about the beta themselves being interesting and worth exploring, what I'd now like to focus on is as you're accessing these beta, right, as you're trying to buy growth through investing in uh, emerging market equities and more specifically uh, what I'll be talking about sort of emerging Asian equities, uh, you also want to think about what well, can I do better, right? Instead of just buying a simple cap-weighted uh, index to get my exposure to, to a Taiwan, to a Korea, to a China. Uh, can I do better? And I think the, the answer here is almost an unequivocal uh, yes. Uh, now, it is going to take a lot of work to do better, but you can do better. And there the hypothesis is these markets are more inefficient. And they're inefficient because of the lack of disciplined uh, long-term capital in those markets and really in many ways a dominance of retail trading. This is a graph that gives you a sense of the degree of retail trading across uh, different markets. Now the blue line represents the US. Now in the US what you're seeing is sort of a net decline. Uh, there was a point in time when US was nearly 80 percent retail trading. Now with emergence of uh, you know, pension institutions in the U.S. where money's taken out of individuals' hand and then professionally managed, pooled, and then delegated. Over time, what you see is households become a very small participant in the equity market. Uh, let's take a look at Japan. Oh, I don't have a laser. But if you take a look at Japan, uh, you know, Japan is now at a shade 
above or below 20, depending on when you're looking at it. Uh, whereas Taiwan and Korea, which are very similar, probably you know, a decade behind in terms of development, are hovering at about 40 or 50 percent. And if you can rewind the clock back, there was a point where all these markets were trading at, again, 70, 80 percent retail trading. Now the question is, do we expect all markets to eventually be dominated purely by institutional uh, asset management and so there's not a lot of retail trading for alpha? Is the future sort of the US pattern for every market? Uh, now research actually shows um, where you plateau off is heavily dependent on the amount of household saving. So if you think of the US, right? the US household saving is basically zero. Now, it is not just a bizarre American culture that doesn't like to save. It is that through forced saving in the pension system, be it corporate pension uh, or public pension, that most American family can get to about 80, 85% uh, replacement rate of their lifetime income. So additional saving doesn't really uh, occur because there's sort of adequate retirement saving through the pension system. So household having no savings means you can't participate in the equity market. Now, this is a different story when you look at, say, a Japan or a Taiwan, you know, both of which uh, have been included in the major indices, are major constituent weights in their respective indices. So there's quite a bit of sort of foreign uh, disciplined institutional capital in those markets. But certainly in the case of Taiwan, it's still you know, nearly 50% retail dominated. And there, the observation is that because there's not an adequate safety net in the form of pension funds, and thus what you have is you still have a lot more household saving as self-insurance. And that is actually the root cause of retail participation. It's not because the market's inherently inefficient that there's more retail investor. It actually is retail investors have higher household balance sheet that cause them to be participants in, in markets. Right? And so judging from there, the eventual asymptote for, say, Chinese household may actually still be 40, 50 percent uh, self-directed uh, investment in the stock market as participants, even as that market continue to mature. And that all points to uh, it's quite likely that there will be a very large reservoir of alpha uh, that can go on for a quite long period of time. All right. So what got me really excited uh, when I first started studying uh, Chinese equity market data is that for the first time, my mom understands what I do and I understand what my mom does. So there is a mental picture I would like you to have. Uh, and this is the mental picture you, you want to hold for the next 30 minutes as I go through how investing looks like in, in China. So on the right hand side, then you kind of can't tell the difference between the right hand side and the left hand side, right? I'll tell you the left hand side is basically a horse betting uh, outfit. Uh, in, in, in New York, where you can go and, and bet on horses. Uh, and the left-hand side of the screen is a normal brokerage house in, in China. Now, a brokerage house in China is actually quite social. You know, people go there, they, they drink tea, they eat sandwiches, they chat, uh, and they, they place trades. And they, they day trade for a few hours before they go off to do their afternoon thing, do grocery shopping. Uh, and we're not talking about an inconsequential small number of people like you might find you know, at a few selective sort of horse racing uh, places. Um, there are thousands of branches, uh, and every one of them probably contribute uh, many tens of million in trading volume on a daily basis. So this is a very, very large business. Uh, and when I say this helps me connect and understand my mom is, uh, you know, my mom is one of the data points I study. She is I would say quite typical of a, a Chinese day trader uh, where she mostly remembers that she's uh, made money from trades and never remembers any trades where she's lost money. And she looks at TV, she's glued to TV. She is the most studious person I know. Um, she's glued to TV watching every news channel and she can't tell the difference between public information versus private information. Right? She thinks she's you know, distilling private insight about how markets work by watching TV. Uh, 
And now she finally understands what I do. Right? She was very disappointed when she first discovered that uh, even though I got a PhD in finance and teach finance, that I couldn't give her any good stock picks. Uh, so now I just told her, well, you know, I don't, I don't actually study the markets as much as I actually study individuals like you and how you impact markets. Uh, so it's been actually a great connecting exercise because I, I get to you know, use my mom as a, a field study data point to understand what's actually going on. Now, a lot of people say, well, you know, maybe this research is not so relevant. It's all fun and interesting, but it's what's occurred in the past. You know, if there's something you can say about, about China, it is that it grows up very fast. Right? It changes so rapidly, so anything you study and you, you sort of distill insight about China is no longer relevant a few years from now. So I'm going to assure you that the presence of retail individuals in markets is unlikely to change in the near future. So this is brokerage account opening. Right? So if you look in every other market, there's anemic brokerage account opening. Right? And people who wanted to punt stocks have an account already. And most people who you know, trade haphazardly have lost most of the money they can speculate with. So there's neither growth, there's actually dwindling volume because it's sort of a self-harming exercise. Uh, not yet in China, right? You're seeing something that one could say is still exponential in terms of growth in account opening. Uh, and you shouldn't be surprised because, again, what caused account opening? Well, it's increase in household balance sheet, right? If you're in an economy that's growing at 5% real, uh, with households that prefer to save more than 30% of their income, uh, that money has to go somewhere, and a lot of it you know, goes into brokerage accounts. Now, you might also say, well, you know, this is all very fun and entertaining. Uh, it gives you an insight into what Chinese retail investors does, uh, but maybe it has limited applicability. Now, what I want to convince you of is there isn't that big of a difference between a Chinese retail investor and an American retail investor versus a you know, Eastern European retail investor. When you look at individual investors, they do about the same thing. All right, so that the past page was U.S. This page is uh, uh, a number of, sort of Asian uh, countries in the Asia, ex-Japan, uh, and then China being singled out. What you see is they do about the same things. Right? Looking at brokerage account data, most Chinese retail investors, like American retail investors, hold like four names. So they heavily concentrated in four names in the industry they work in, right? Precisely everything we tell you not to do when you study for your CFA. They trade way too much, right? Given that they're the least informed people in the room, they trade way more than anyone else, right? right? Usually trading is a way of reflecting private information, and so you should only trade more if you're the most informed person. But they trade way more when, in fact, they have almost no information. They easily confuse sort of public information that's in the paper, that's, that's on the news, which is quite delayed and quite old, as sort of proprietary information they need to go act on immediately. Uh, they love buying stocks with very, very low price. Right? So penny stocks are awesome because they can buy many, many tens of thousands of shares. And there's a greater possibility of them becoming overnight millionaires if these stocks simply go from 50 cents to $2. Uh, so there's these sort of delusion um, that we, we, we know are not rational. Uh, and you, you find them looking at brokerage account data, and it's true across the board, uh, be it Chinese, be it Americans, uh, you know, be it anyone else. Retail individuals do about the same thing. And when you track them over time, there's no evidence that a retail individual, as they trade more, um, they realize the error in their ways, and they go read you know, the CFA curriculum, become wise, and certainly become more experienced. Right? If you look at an American retail investor, right, there's no evidence that they have become more skilled and, and less behavioral in nature. And the only reason the US market has become more efficient is not because you know, retail investors in the US are, are, are more intelligent and, and have been taught the right lessons by market. It's because they've been eliminated from the market. Right? And so all of these funny anecdotes that we, we study by looking at US data uh, now actually becomes quite impactful when you look at China because 90% of the market behaves that way. So it's not 5%, which usually wouldn't have enough impact on the markets. This is 90%. Right? So there's a lot of asset pricing implications here. 
And this is where, as a behavioral economist, you can have some real credibility, right? You're not just talking about something that is sort of interesting for, for, for a lecture purpose, right? You're actually talking about something um, that foundationally um, represent real investment opportunity, a very sizable retail, uh, very sizable investment opportunity. Now, before I can tell you sort of the results, I, I will have to complain and grovel a little bit about how horrible the data is, just so you appreciate how much work goes into this. So the first thing you have to realize is there's not a lot of uh, long horizon data when you look at EM. And China, in particular, has short data. Uh, if you want to have a sensible cross-section, so the the statistics of cross-sectional research can, can, can actually be, uh, be applied, you almost have you know, no more than 20 years of data. Right? If you try to push further, uh, the cross-section is quite narrow. It's just a few state-owned banks, and it's not terribly interesting to look at. So the data is about, I would say, anywhere from a third to a fourth of the length of what you usually get in the, in the US. And if you're familiar with how t-stats are computed, that means even if it's identical effect, the T-SAT would be half the size. Right? So you can't be too dogmatic about, hey, I need a T-SAT of two before I believe anything. This is where you have to be more of a Bayesian, meaning, OK, if this effect works in the US, and it works well in China, but I don't quite have a T-SAT of two, uh, your Bayesian updating will tell you, hey, it's probably true in China as well. And so you kind of have to use that approach. And then you sort of marry that with some theory, uh, and then also some robustness testing by looking at, say, the comparable time in Taiwan, a comparable time period in Japan, to establish validity. That would be sort of the statistical approach. Um, there are all sorts of other weirdness that we don't have to deal with uh, when looking at, say, UK data or US data. Uh, there's this thing called voluntary self-suspension. And I do want to talk about this, because it is actually uh, uh, funny. Uh, and, and this is probably the point in, in the talk where a joke would wake everyone up as well. Uh, so voluntary suspension uh, is a quite interesting thing. So what you usually think of you know, exchange sanction that prevents a stock from trading because you know, failure to, to, to report on time or you know, some kind of disclosure defect. But no, in China, you could actually voluntarily suspend your own trading. So why do firms do that? Now, why would firms voluntarily take liquidity out of their own stocks? Well, as it turns out, if they're about to announce bad news, they would actually just suspend trading of their stocks and hopefully um, wait it out and people will forget. Right? Uh, or if like, there's a major bear market and they know their stock has a beta, right? you know, maybe even a high beta, and it would decline more than market, they would just suspend trading. Now, of course, if markets are rational, if you suspend trading and during that time period market declines 20%, you have a beta one, when you resume trading, day one you should be down 20%. But no, people sort of just forget and they open up trading at like the same price. And so this waiting it out, as crazy as that might sound, actually works. And so you actually regularly, sometimes you have 20% of the market you know, voluntarily halt trading on their stocks. So that's something you have to sort of deal with statistically. So uh, handling all that, that noisy data uh, and then kind of understanding these weird microstructures, once you get that all taken care of, you can start to do, do some research. Now I'm going to talk about uh, factors, some of which you're quite familiar with. Uh, but I'm going to give you a spin, which is uh, I'm going to give you sort of first of a behavioral narrative. And I'm going to convince you that it's really the behavioral narrative that makes sense because um, you're going to see that what's driving the returns isn't through sort of the risk mechanism. Right? Oftentimes, it's through something that's completely unrated to risk. So I'll show you something. So value. You know, value works really well in China. And we know it works decently well everywhere else. And we also know that value has very little to do with value companies are fantastic companies. Right? It mostly has to do with, uh, on average, growth companies are horrible investments. Right? And it has to do with you know, growth companies tend to be too expensive. People expect too much growth. Uh, people price growth to, to perfection. Growth is sexier. Growth gets promoted. And therefore, you know, value investing is really less about value. It's about you know, a lot of growth stocks are just bad to own. And in China, that's even more the case. 
right? In, in the U.S., when you're avoiding growth companies, you're avoiding you know, companies that are trading at 30x, 40x. In China, you're avoiding companies that are trading at 80x, 200x, right? And so the effect of avoiding these bad growth uh, is just a lot better. But there's something else that usually doesn't occur when you look at sort of value portfolios elsewhere. Now, we, we see value traps, and you can work you know, a little bit or a lot uh, it doesn't make a lot of difference anywhere else, but in China it makes a difference because if you don't build your portfolio uh, by sort of taking out the state-owned enterprises, what you'll see is your portfolio will largely be dominated by value traps. So they're state-owned enterprises that look cheap, but they're forever cheap. And they're forever cheap for very good reasons, right? They're not really for-profit organizations, right? Sometimes, occasionally, they have pressure to make a profit, uh, but generally, uh, if they make too much money, you know, the state will come in and say you have to lower prices because you sort of is a protected monopoly. Uh, and sometimes they'll have to come in and sort of subsidize what the state wants to get done. And this is especially true in China where it's quite a sort of interventionalist uh, market. Uh, and so you shouldn't be surprised that state-owned enterprises are just perpetually cheap. They're, they're not actually better investments uh, given um, how low their, their value multiples are. And so you have to neutralize that out. And this is where you kind of understand, oh, you know, value effect is, is really driven by these you know, market microstructures really related to growth being too expensive rather than a correlation issue, right? Because if you look at correlation issues, well, these you know, uh, low-cost, massive state-owned prices actually dominate the correlation. Low volatility. This is another uh, factor that's sort of tried and true in the U.S. And again, it works really, really well in China. And part of the reason why it works really well in China, again, speaks to the behavioral channel. Uh, in China, uh, the preference for lottery, which is oftentimes why we believe low vol works. Again, it's not because the low volatility stocks are somehow more interesting, have better return, uh, because there's stronger fundamental growth. It mostly is because the high beta stocks have poor returns. Right? It's, it's actually one of the most embarrassing things for, for us teaching finance. Right? When we teach CAPM, we say, hey, you know, returns related to risk, risk is related to beta, higher beta is higher return. And then if you don't come back and take you know, investment 201, um, you will forever have that misconception about high beta and higher return. And then invest in two hours, we tell you, oh, actually, when we look at the data, there's no relationship between you know, beta and return. And it's driven by this. High beta stocks generally have sort of irrational excess demand from people who speculate for fun. And, and the funniest uh, research I can cite on this is, uh, and this is uh, in, in Taiwan, I think it's been replicated in Korea as well. On the day of national lottery, the stock market volume in Taiwan drops by about a quarter. And the larger is the jackpot, the more is the volume drop, right? So there's this substitution between gambling and showing up to the stock market. Uh, and so, again, if you look at extremely high beta high and high volatility stocks, what you'll generally see is um, the ownership and the trading is largely retail rather than sort of disciplined institutional. And so you're not surprised then irrational excess demand for uh, high beta generally leads to poor returns. You know, whatever the retail likes generally tends to do worse. Right. And again, uh, we talked about state-owned enterprise. This matters again. A lot of state-owned enterprises in China don't trade very much. And they almost don't trade very much by construction because there's a lot of cross-holding. And different state-owned enterprises just aren't in the business of trading each other's shares to generate volatility. And so again, if you don't neutralize out, the state ownership as sort of an indicator, uh, you'll mistakenly create a low vol portfolio that's sheerly state owned enterprises. And again, you won't capture this behavioral anomaly. And now I'm going to segue from sort of tried and true factors that you've all heard of uh, that probably you know, isn't as, and as interesting to something that's a little bit more entertaining. Looking at accounting. Uh, so accounting factors. Now accounting factors are not new at all, right? Accounting factors have been around since uh, late 70s, early 80s. Just by and large researchers completely lost interest. Because today, 
the US looks like the top. Right? The top histogram, the way you want to read that is you know, on your uh, x-axis, these are ROE. So you can think of sort of earnings growth. This is a good interpretation of that. You know, some are positive, some are negative. On average, it's about 10%. So the US looks quite normal. And this is why there's no need to do very much research on it, because you're not going to find anything particularly weird. So all the wonderful accounting literature on how to identify you know, fraud, aggressive accounting, really just doesn't do very much. right? Since the publication of those papers in the early 80s, the effect's largely gone. The bottom histogram, China. And in fact, we have a graph that shows every one of the emerging countries. And they all largely look like that. So there's not a China-specific issue. Right? And when you look at this, the story is not, hey, invest in Chinese companies because they always have positive earnings growth. Right? That is not, not the narrative. Right? The narrative is, hey, there are lots of companies over here. Um, and they're simply not reporting their earnings correctly. Right? They have a negative earnings growth, but they're reporting as positive. Uh, and what they're doing is not even something very sophisticated. They're simply aggressively rebooking um, sort of inventory as goods sold and pile on accrual. Right? Even a very simple indicator of looking at accruals, uh, abnormal accrual growth, will help you capture this. So when I say, people say, hey, you can't really build a quant model to understand emerging markets, to understand China, because the data is garbage. It's garbage and garbage out. I think that's a misunderstanding, right? What you should get excited about is because data is garbage. If you have the skill to clean the data, back out what's true, you have an enormous advantage versus the retail individuals who cannot do that. Right? And so this, in, in many cases, is both an enormous challenge to get it right, but also an enormous opportunity. Right. And this is sort of the difference in return, uh, spread about 8% uh, over time uh, if you use sort of cumulative of normal accrual. Let me jump on that. All right. So something else that's sort of a newer factor that probably doesn't get talked about as much. Uh, DFA, more recently uh, adopted in sort of a three mo three factor model, have gone to a, a five-factor model. And one of the things that they have added is called uh, investment conservatism, or asset growth. Now, the corporate finance theory about why you want to look at the uh, investment growth for a company goes as follows. But before I give you the answer, how many people here think that a firm that has more aggressive investment versus their industry peers, right? a firm with more aggressive investment posture should deliver higher stock returns. How many people think that? Most of us do because we actually teach that in the CFA curriculum, right? right? How do you have a higher stock return? You have to have a higher G, right? How do you have a higher G? You have to plow back more. So investment as a fraction of the firm size has to be larger. So if you reinvest more, You'll grow faster. If you grow faster, you'll have higher stock return. Right? That's what we teach in the textbook. Um, but what we forgot to tell you is when we look at data, it's just not true again. Right? This is actually quite embarrassing for finance. A lot of things we teach you seems quite sensible, but it's just not true in data. Uh, so what we now know is, well, a lot of firms that aggressively invest, it's not because they have better projects. It often has to do with the CEO uh, displaying humorous, right? Hubris. He just believes that whatever he touches will turn into gold. And so it's not optimal investment that you're observing. It's often overinvestment. And those that have the largest plowback, largest reinvestments, actually tend to be firms that just have the most sort of hubris and overconfident CEO. And so that's what, what we actually see in data. So firms that actually re reinvest aggressively tend to do more poorly. So what can we do with that intuition? So we see that pattern in, in China, certainly. Uh, but how do we apply that intuition? Where does it show up? Now, in China, overinvestments come from a certain type of entities. Now, do you want to guess which? Oh. Yeah, state-owned enterprises. Uh, and so if you... If you don't have clear identifiers 
for which company state owned enterprise. If you can't read Chinese, uh, it, you, know, you can't process original text, it does become more difficult to figure out which you know, company you're looking at is actually a state owned enterprise. Uh, so one way is actually simply tease out those that have massively higher level investments versus their industry peers. It's one of the easiest ways to find if a company is a state owned enterprise. And particularly, this is particularly true post 2009. So what happened post 2009? We had basically quantitative easing conducted by every single major economy, right? And the way in which China conducts quantitative easing is the you know, People's Bank of China lends money to all the state-owned enterprise banks, and the state-owned enterprise banks lends money to all the state-owned enterprises that are in manufacturing, in mining, uh, in oftentimes not terribly productive industries, and their job is just go spend money and hire people, right? And of course, these are very negative ROE, very negative MPV investments. Right? And so again, this is where the theory of uh, overinvestment, not to the benefit of investors, are captured in China, so just through a different mechanism. In this case, you're not perhaps seeing hubris in CEO. What you're seeing is you're seeing sort of non-economic decisions being conducted by essentially CEOs whose KPIs are not share prices. Something very specific to China. So now we're going to segue into uh, factors that are quite local to the Chinese economy. So many stocks in China, uh, if they're listed domestically, they're referred to as the A shares. Now, when they cross list into Hong Kong, they're then referred to as H. Usually, they have the identical shareholder right. And so they are the same claims on the same company, same cash flow, same rights. But oftentimes, the H can trade at a 20% discount. And that hasn't really gone away with the opening of the, the, the borders uh, with the introduction of Stock Connect, which allows money to move freely from Hong Kong into China to buy A shares and allows uh, capital from China to go into Hong Kong to buy Hong Kong traded shares. Uh, we thought, you know, with, with sort of the barrier being broken down, that we would have parity in how the A and the H trade. Not at all, right? If you look at that blue line, uh, generally the blue line is about, you know, more recently 20 to 25% above where 100 would be. That's, that's parity, right? And so what we discover is, and the, the lesson from here is, as a reservoir of inefficiency, the amount of disciplined efficient capital that has to go from Hong Kong into China to cause the A shares pricing to converge to the H share pricing. The capital is so enormous that right now it simply can't happen. Right? It doesn't happen and right now it can't happen yet. Uh, what is actually happening is if you measure the price discovery in Hong Kong, and this is actually a statement by, made by the, one of the exchange officers, what they observe is that the quality of prices in Hong Kong has actually deteriorated as a result of sort of you know, bilateral movement of funds. Right? So instead of money coming through Hong Kong to make Chinese market more efficient, it's really the Chinese retail money now exiting into Hong Kong that's actually making the Hong Kong market more inefficient. Right. I'm going to share with you uh, something that we pulled out of uh, Korea. And we see this in China as well. So, uh, so again, you know, this is unique to a few of the emerging Asian economies. Uh, Pledge shares. You know, what is a pledge share? So pledge share is when the uh, founding entrepreneur contributes shares he owns in a company to, the, to, to his private bank in exchange for funding. You might say, well, that's a very bizarre way to finance your company. And in fact, it is quite bizarre. It doesn't happen anywhere else other than Korea and China. And what happens is uh, in China and in Korea, unless you're well connected to a group that controls a bank, it's very difficult to get a line of credit to get debt financing. Uh, and in the presence of such severe capital constraint, uh, often founders have to pledge their own net worth to get a line of credit, pennies on the dollar, and they lend it back to their own enterprise. So in many ways, you can think of this as a very extreme form of insider buying, right? 
It's not just the director buying 5,000 shares of stocks. It's literally someone, you know, ponying up $300 million in, um, in equity collateral to borrow $100 million and then lend it back to his own company. And so you're not surprised that the difference between companies that have high pledging activities versus companies that have no pledging activities is a difference about 20% per annum. And this is out of Korea, and it's about you know, 12, 13% in China. So you know, quite specialized uh, to, to the Chinese and Korean market, but the corporate finance uh, intuition is, is, is exactly the same as how we teach it uh, anywhere else. In Taiwan, now this data is, is quite exclusive uh, to Taiwan because the Taiwan Stock Exchange actually publishes this daily. So the Taiwan Stock Exchange is fascinated with understanding who's buying and who's trading. And so in any, on any given day, they'll tell you, is it foreign institution? Is it domestic institutions? And of course, if it's not, it's domestic retail individuals. So you can actually look at stocks that are widely held by domestic individuals. You can look at stocks as widely bought by domestic individuals. And again, here are the difference is those that are um, widely bought by retail individuals over the next 140 days have one of the worst returns compared to the peer group. And, and again, that just goes to prove that uh, retail individuals everywhere generally make very poor uh, decisions. Right? And, uh, and if you're able to understand what they do uh, you don't even have to understand why they do it. You just have to understand what they do and do exactly the opposite. Uh, you'll actually be quite successful in, in emerging markets. And so, in fact, if you think about a uh, way to generate alpha, right, most of us work way too hard. Right? We try to forecast what our earnings is going to grow fast. We try to understand the industry shifts. We try to you know, model all sorts of complicated things about corporations, industries, management. Uh, you can sort of recast a problem by simply looking at the people who are persistent losers. And I think much of sort of behavioral finance, much of uh, uh, behavioral factor investing is about that. It is actually not looking at something foundationally complicated, deep about companies and, and industries. It's just really looking at something as basic as uh, the persistent losers in an economy. Now, of course, you do have to find an economy with a large reservoir of them for this to, to, to actually be a viable trading strategy. So let me, uh, let, me, let me summarize. I'm upon uh, my, my 45 minutes, and I want to leave you know, a little over 10 minutes for, for Q&A. So the key takeaway, behavioral factor premiums are just larger in emerging markets. And they're larger because these markets simply have more irrational retail trading. Right? And these are the people that end up being supplier of alpha. So that part should not surprise you. Right? And uh, these markets being more inefficient uh, will change over time, of course, as more institutional money goes in and crowd out the retail individuals. And as more of the retail individuals uh, sort of learn painful lesson and exit the market, we do see most markets gradually become more and more efficient in the alpha potential declining. So a great way to estimate how much alpha might still be around is really to look at the fraction of trades that's generated by, by retail individuals. So when it goes to 5% like the US, it's very difficult for you to systematically harvest alpha. Second key takeaway, uh, there are a number of economies, particularly Asian economies, and right now certainly the Chinese economy, that have very high fraction of retail trading. So even the more advanced ones like Japan is you know, above 20, uh, Taiwan and Korea about 50, and China at, at 85. Uh, so China being both, you know, proportional-wise, high in retail trading, and also size-wise, right? It's probably, at, on any given day, potentially even the more liquid market. Uh, the reservoir is actually quite large, and I think this actually makes studying all these behavioral uh, mistakes uh, meaningful and relevant. Right? There's actually an opportunity to harvest that, even at the institutional level. And so that makes that interesting and worthwhile looking at. Uh, whereas, you know, perhaps looking at an economy like Vietnam or Indonesia today, sure, lots of retail trading, but just not large enough uh, to really create a strategy around to benefit institutional investors. Uh, and then finally, uh, even though some of the tried and true factors uh, 
uh, do work in China, you do have to understand uh, the local market uh, structure. You do have to understand the regulation. You do have to understand the institutions because oftentimes you will have to uh, localize these factors, whether it's dealing with state-owned enterprises, uh, whether it's dealing with changes in rules and regulations as how they govern dividend payouts. Uh, and so these are actually quite necessary to, to, to make things work well. And then some of the factors that's already forgotten because they stopped working in the U.S. because the market's become efficient to them. They're still alive and strong uh, in China, so it's worthwhile to go back to some of the old articles, revive them, understand them, and see if uh, they're still present uh, in, in China. And then there are going to be factors that are quite unique um, to these uh, emerging economies. Uh, and I showed you some that are unique to Taiwan, to Korea, to China. And they largely have to do with data availability. You know, a lot of data availability just isn't there for the U.S. for privacy reasons. That's less of an issue in, in many of these Asian exchanges. Uh, and also, uh, they simply uh, just have different market microstructures that allow them to sort of manifest the behavioral uh, biases differently. Oh, thank you, Jason.